So hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. We'll begin with a new text today in continuation with the poetry that we just been covered uh, recently. Uh, and the poem we'll start off with today is T.S. Eliot's uh, Preludes, which is part of the uh, Proofrock and Other Observations collections. So we just finished with Proofrock, the love song on J. Arthur Proofrock, and we find how this particular poem entitled Preludes is a continuation thematically as well as stylistically of so some of the things that we discussed already in Proofrock. So the first thing that uh, one notices about this poem, and this should be on the screen, is that these are like four different pieces put together. So preludes, as you know, are music pieces. They are like the pieces of music which uh, prelude uh, the main uh, composition. So the initiation pieces, the um, you know, introductory pieces before the main composition begins. That's the classic definition of preludes in terms of a music vocabulary, a music metaphor. Now. What this poem does is that it gives you different vignettes of uh, city images. It has a very montage-like quality and we've seen already how um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock too con contains a lot of cinematic qualities, montage qualities, you know, certain visual uh, styles which are very cinematic in quality and, and we have the same kind of images and preludes as well. Right, so if you take a look at this poem, this is about uh, metropolitan drudgery, this is about the uh, ennui. Uh, in the metropolis, the boredom, the inertia in the metropolis, and also about decadence. So, in a, a lot of decadent images, images of decadence, images of consumption, uh, images of being consumed. So, we have this sort of human beings consumed uh, through a metropolitan lifestyle, through a metropolitan decadence. That is something which keeps coming up in Eliot's poetry. And after this, we'll move on to Wasteland, which is uh, one of the biggest and one of the most famous poems Eliot ever wrote, and one of the most famous works in 20th century literature, and you find how that these elements of metropolitan ennui, drudgery, uh, you know, they all reach the culmination in the wasteland, which is essentially about a wasted metropolis, a spent metropolis, a tired metropolis. But over here too, in this particular poem prelude, we have a series of images which are reflective of the wasted quality of the urban setting, the, the metropolis, right? So the metropolis and mental life, which is um, the name of the book, which I perhaps recommended already by George Simmel. Uh, so, you know, that setting, the metropolis and the mental life, they converge together to create a, a series of images which are one of uh, ennui, inertia and boredom and decadence, of course. And that's something which we find uh, in a recurring in Eliot's poetry or in modernist poetry in general. Now, there is a, a voice in this particular poem, this is the first person voice and uh, oftentimes the speaker uh, addresses the reader as you, right? And there are different human elements, the different human figures in this particular poem. But what's interesting to see is how the human uh, qualities, the human figures, the human presences are represented uh, in very, very metonymic terms, fragmented terms. And again, that connects to some of the um, issues which we dealt with already in uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, the fragmentation and alienation of modern life and how the metropolitan life uh, generates this alienation or produces this alienation, how this alienation becomes uh, an effect, uh, a contagious effect which uh, infects everyone, which infects the inhabitants of the metropolis. Right, so alienation, boredom, ennui, uh, decadence. So these become some of the recursive, recursive markers in Eliot's early poetry, especially with the way uh, the human figures are represented very metonymically. So we, if you remember in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, we saw how uh, even that poem, we have human figures represented through uh, very, very uh, metonymic images, a shortcut like a finger, uh, a smoking pipe, uh, you know, leaning uh, outside the window. So lonely man in shirt sleeves leaning out, out the window. So again, those are images which don't give you a holistic and whole picture of the human self. And so it gives you a very fragmented image of the human self. And this fragmentation uh, on the part of representation is part of the theme. So again, look at the way in which the style, the manner of representation and a matter, what is represented and how it is represented, they converge together in very interesting and complex ways. So that, that convergence is very, very complex. And we have something very similar happening in this poem as well, where the human beings are represented uh, using metonymic uh, images but in a very metonymic manner, you know, a, a, f a finger perhaps, a hand perhaps, uh, a sartorial object perhaps, a decadent object perhaps, but never fully, right? So never in a holistic full form. And that, that kind of uh, in a representation which is essentially one of fragmentation and interruption 
uh, is part of the uh, representation of politics in Eliot's early poetry and which is obviously reflective of the human condition of alienation and boredom and ennui and decadence. Okay, so that's the uh, general background in, in, in out of which this, this poem emerges and out of which Eliot's early poetry emerges in general. So let's take a look at the poem and see how that gets corroborated and reflected in this poem. So this is produced uh, in four different fragments and four different uh, passages uh, which should be on the screen now. So this is the first prelude. The winter evening settles down with its smell of steaks and passageways. Six o'clock, the burned out ends of smoky days, and now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots, and at the corner of the street a lonely cab horse steams and stamps and then the lightning of the lambs. So the very first, let's take a look at the first couple of lines, the opening. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes and passageways. So you know, these passageways are obviously very narrow passageways. These are not broad expansive passageways. So you can smell the stakes being fried. So again, look at the way in which the sensory quality in the poem is manifested or manifests itself very directly and immediately at the very beginning of the poem. It's very, very sensory. You can smell the steaks being fried in the passageways and the evening is settling down with the smell. So again, the, the evening has almost, a, there's almost a tactile quality about how the evening is experienced. Uh, uh, so again, you can see the olfactory quality and the tactile quality, they converge together to create very, very complex cognitive conditions. Uh, so the winter evening settling down with the steaks being fried together. So the temporality of the evening and the tactility and the olfactory quality of this uh, you know, steaks being fried, they combine together to create a very complex cognitive condition, right, which is being represented over here. And now we have the image, uh, this recursive cutting in of clock time and we've already spoken uh, of the different dimensions of time in Eliot's early poetry. So we've seen how clock time and real time or clock time and psychological time, they are sometimes in sync and sometimes out of sync in Eliot's early poetry. And we find this politics of time uh, uh, you know, recursive in modernist literature. So when we move on to something like Wasteland, uh, Mrs. Dalloway and most famously in Joyce's Ulysses, which is also a text which we'll cover. We find this convergence and out of sync, convergence and incompatibility of clock time and real time or clock time and psychological time is something which the modernist uh, narratives you know, engage with very, very complexly. So six o'clock is a clock time away. Six o'clock is a time and the winter evening is settling down with the very tactile, dense smell of steaks in the passageways. And immediately after we have a metaphysical conceit. So if you remember, uh, a metaphysical conceit is that technique in which two very seemingly or apparently disparate entities are combined together, compared together to create a cognitive effect. That effect could be one of shock, that effect could be one of recognition, that effect could also be one of uh, reawakening. So you know, if you remember, uh, you know, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is a poem which we just finished prior to this. Uh, the image of uh, measuring out your days in coffee spoons. So the coffee spoon is something very mundane, uh, something very domestic uh, and the whole idea of measuring out your day is something very existential and abstract and perhaps profound as well. So the profundity of measuring out the day with the banality of the coffee spoon combined together, it creates a very complex cognitive condition uh, which can sometimes be shocking in quality and which, which can convey a sense of uh, waking up, it can, it can contain an epiphany for instance, it can contain an enlightenment, it can contain uh, a sense of shudder as well. Now this particular image, uh, the burned out ends of smoky days, when a day coming to an end is compared to a cigarette butt, right? So again, uh, this, it's like just the way a cigarette is consumed, uh, the day is getting consumed over here. And of course the day is an experience over here, so the experientiality of the day is important for us to understand and unpack, right? So. Uh, again, the cigarette butt which is coming to an end because of the way it is being smoked away and the day coming to an end because you know it's coming to an, it's been exhausted are compared together in, in a very interesting way which is also quite shocking and also quite complex in quality. Okay, so the burnt out ends, so the burnt out ends of a smoky day, so this, the entire day is like a cigarette which is coming to an end, so this evening is the last leg of the day, right, and that's coming to an end in, uh, in the course of time. So again, look at the way in how, in how temporality and tactility 
uh, combine together. So, the temporality of the day coming to an end and the tactility of the cigarette, the, the, the sense of holding a cigarette or experiencing a cigarette coming to an end uh, are combined together in a very interesting combination and a very interesting, um, you know, conjunction and uh, juxtaposition which is a classic example of metaphysical conceit and this is something, this is a technique that Eliot borrows heavily or draws on heavily and obviously he is using the legacy of the metaphysical poets like John Donne uh, and Andrew Marvel. Okay, and he was a big admirer of Donne and Marvel's poetry. Those of you interested in Eliot would know that he had written several essays uh, advocating that kind of poetry in favor of the metaphysical poets and also individual essays on individual poets like Donne and Marvel. Okay, so the whole idea of the day coming to an end like cigarette is conveyed to us and then we have a series of very decadent uh, depressing images of mundane metropolitan uh, uh, langa or mundane metropolitan boredom. And now a gusty shower wraps, suddenly it is a shower over here, a gusty shower, there is something very sprightly about it, something very, very immediate about it, something very, very quick about it, a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. So again, if you look at, take a look at the uh, different materials, the different signifiers of boredom away uh, and decadent and, and you know, purposelessness, uh, you know, you get a feel that, you get a feel that this is connected to a more, a, a broader sense of boredom. So, withered leaves are dead leaves. So, these are leaves which have come to an end, uh, these are leaves which have died, uh, presumably with the arrival of winter and the, the leaves have not been um, broomed away. So, the leaves are still at your feet. So, again, this is the first image of the human being over here and again, the focus is on the feet, right. So, the foot over here is, uh, it is almost a close up of the foot. Uh, again, a very metonymic thing. So, the entire human body is not represented and so what we get is just a foot and it focuses on the foot and it is like a magnification of the foot uh, in a very, very cinematic way. And the feet are covered with withered leaves. So, the leaves have come to an end, the leaves have died a natural death. And along with that, we have the example of newspapers from vacant lots. So, remember these are evening newspapers. So, these are newspapers which do not really have any function anymore, which do not really have any significance anymore. So, there is a degree of liquidation uh, in terms of significance, liquidation in terms of importance. There is an exhaustion of importance, an exhaustion of significance over here. So, these are newspapers which are just uh, waste paper because these are, this is an evening uh, and, and by the time the day arrives at an evening, uh, most of the news gets consumed. So, the whole idea, the whole uh, image of being consumed uh, is something which we see over here immediately. The withered leaves have been consumed by time, the newspapers have been consumed by time and these are newspapers which are from the vacant lots. So, these are from the vacant spaces in the narrow passageways and the newspapers and leaves they are all sort of clubbing together and uh, rustling your, your feet as you walk down that particular neighborhood. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. So, again the broken blinds, the broken windows and the chimney pots. So, this, these, are, these are homes which presumably do not belong to wealthy people. This is very unlike the space where women come and go talking on Michelangelo. So, this is not that kind of space, this is not a cultural space. Rather, uh, these are space where in the ordinary hard working, uh, working class people live. Uh, with narrow passageways, with broken blinds, with chimney pots, with uh, you know dead leaves and newspapers from vacant lots. So, these are very working class neighborhoods uh, which has been depicted over here. So, again the very drudgery of the city life, the very, very claustrophobic quality of the city life which is also decadent in quality is something which we get uh, a very visual picture of and by visual I mean very cinematic. If you take a look at the visual grammar over here, the, the politics of representation over here, and it seems to be boring or drawing heavily on cinema. Or for instance, the whole idea of magnification, the close up, the long shot. So, we get a long shot of the city which gives you a panoramic view of the city in terms of the, uh, the uniformity and the standardization and the boredom of the city. And then take a look at some closer things with a series of close ups. So, you have the close up of the foot, the close up on the dirty uh, you know, the leaves, uh, the dirty newspapers and those close ups and the long shot put together, they give you a sense of the boredom, the, the inertia that is experienced over here. And the final image of inertia, the final image of boredom, the final image of uh, you know, decadence, the final image of being consumed is represented over here with the image of the lonely cab horse, ok. So, on the corner of the street the lonely cab horse steams and stands and then the lightning of the lamps, right. So, there is something almost automatic about this image. 
So the cab horse is on a corner street, a lonely cab horse. So it's sort of bonded with something. It is tied to something. So it's like a bonded labor, for instance. It's not free. So the lonely cab horse over here becomes or maybe read as a metaphor of the modern man. A uh, modern man who's tied to his uh, compulsions, tied to his duties, tied to boredom, tied to inertia, tied to drudgery, tied, tied to reputations. Right? So this very really repetitive ritual of modern life is being represented through the image of the lonely cab horse. So the lonely cab horse steams and stamps. So again, there's no forward movement, it's steaming and stamping, it's inertia, it's standing in one particular point and stamping the foot. And almost like an automatic movement, out of the stamping comes the light, the lighting of the lamps. So the light, lamps in the street begin to glow immediately. But you know, unlike most images of illumination, unlike more traditional images of lightning and illumination and enlightenment, this is an image of darkness. So the lighting which comes in this neighborhood with the lonely cap or steaming and stamping, it serves further or serves to accentuate the darkness further, right? So it doesn't really illuminate anything, doesn't really give you a sense of hope uh, or the disappearance of despair, nothing of that sort happens. Instead what we get is an accentuation of despair. Uh, so the darkness gets accentuated, the darkness gets more highlighted with the light. So this is a light which doesn't uh, throw light onto anything. So and again one can think back uh, and connect this to Marlowe and how the darkness where he comes back as an enlightened person but his enlightenment is a very negative enlightenment and he realizes that you know uh, whatever knowledge he has will be too dark, too dark altogether to be conveyed to an uninitiated audience. That's why he has to lie to Chris's intended if you remember that section. So again we have something similar over here. So the lightning of the lamps over here doesn't serve to illuminate anything, it doesn't serve to give knowledge, illumination, epiphany of any kind. The only epiphany available uh, in this condition is an epiphany of darkness, an epiphany of nothingness, right? So that's the only epiphany, that's the only knowledge available, the knowledge of nothingness. And that nothingness is depicted through several material markers, the evening newspapers, the withered leaves, the broken blinds, the lonely horse uh, who's sort of tied to a particular cab, for instance, and steaming and stamping with no forward movement. So all that, all these material markers, they all come together and uh, it so sort of creates an economy of exhaustion, so to say. Everything is exhausted and spent and used and claustrophobic in this condition. Okay, so that's the first stanza of Eliot's Preludes. Uh, so we, we begin to see how the entire idea of the evening settling down uh, doesn't create a sense of homeliness, it doesn't create a sense of uh, warmth, it doesn't create a sense of domestic bliss. Instead, it creates a sense of despair, a, a sense of alienation, a sense of brokenness, a sense of fragmentation, which is what we get in the very first stanza. And now move on to the second stanza, where the speaker says, The morning comes to consciousness of faint, stale smells of beer, from the sawdust crumpled street, with all the muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. With the other masquerades, the time resumes. One thinks of all the hands that are raised in dingy shapes and a thousand furnished rooms. So again, the whole idea of the morning come into consciousness. So the, the temporality of the morning, which is an abstract thing, is being humanized over here. So we have a human dimension of time. So the morning is coming to consciousness. Uh, and again, look at the way in which how traditional markers of positivity like the lightning of the lamps, consciousness, which, which are traditionally speaking, conventionally speaking, markers of positivity, markers of illumination, markers of knowledge. But see how these traditional markers are subverted into something else. So how does the morning come to consciousness? The morning comes to consciousness of faint, stale smells of beer. So again, beer is, uh, is depicted over here as this entire uh, idea of consuming alcohol, uh, which is stale, which is faint. Uh, and that gives you a hangover in the morning. So you wake up with a hangover, uh, you wake up tired, you wake up already heavy in the head. So it's not really a sprightly start to the day. Instead, it's actually a sort of decadence, a sort of heaviness, a start of a hangover, right? So which is a carryover from the previous day. Now this idea of the hangover, this metaphor of the hangover is important over here because what it means is you're never really leaving behind your drudgery. You're carrying it forward to the next day and every day is a continuation of the hangover. Every day is a continuation of the drudgery, the continuation of the claustrophobia which is uh, 
softwood but it's lovejet over here. So the whole idea of the, the whole image of the faint stale smells of beer as an alcoholic drink with which you wake up in the morning and suffer the hangover serves to represent the continuation of drudgery. So it becomes a metaphor of the continuation of drudgery, the repetitive ritual of drudgery which is being represented over here. Now the next image is interesting. We get the sense of the sawdust trampled street. So it is sawdust trampled, it is dirty and it is a typically dusty street which is so sprinkled with water just to keep the dust down. But of course what that makes, what that and enables what that makes us, uh, it makes the street dirty and muddy, right. So, uh, in order to keep the street clean, uh, in order to keep the street less dusty, there is an attempt to sprinkle water in it, but that makes things worse, it makes things more sticky, more muddy, uh, more dirty, more dingy in quality. So, from the sawdust trampled street with all this muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. So, again, the focus is on the feet. So, never do we see a complete human image. Uh, forget about human self, even the human body is not represented as a totality over here. So, that just goes to show the extent of fragmentation, the length of fragmentation which is suffered by modern man, wherein the human self, the human body, the human awareness, the human presence is always represented as a metonymic, broken, alienated, incomplete entity. And this incompletion is important, this interruption is important. So, the human subject can only be an interrupted subject in this um, drudgery of modernity. So, the muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. So, the coffee stands over here, they do not become metaphors of uh, uh, healthy consumption, they become metaphors of a, a certain degree of intoxication, a certain degree of addiction. So, you need coffee in the morning to get up and wake up properly and carry on your duties for the day. So, again coffee over here becomes a metaphor for you know a certain degree of addiction, a certain degree of numbness. So, you know you just denumb yourself with coffee. Uh, and then you go on and carry on the duties for the day. So, the muddy feet press into us a coffee stand. So, the morning comes to consciousness, the image of beer, the metaphor of beer over here becomes an image of hangover which is a continuation of drudgery and then you have the whole idea of the sawdust trampled street which is that of a muddy dirty street and then you have the muddy feet which is a very metonymic representation of the human subject, the human body broken down into small fragments, into small organs uh, and that obviously uh, undercuts the organicity of the human cell, it becomes just an inorganic entity, or something almost machinic about its movement. Uh, the muddy feet press in towards the early coffee stands, it is almost like a collective movement, uh, a uniform standardized movement towards the coffee stand. So, uniformity and standardization were the two different, the uh, two main mantras of metropolitan life and what those do uh, in a more generic way, uniformity and standardization, it takes away individuality and agency, right. So, the individuality and agency they get completely undercut uh, by the whole uh, over reliant on uniformity and standardization. So, the entire collective uh, body of way, the entire people, all the people who wake up in the morning, they all present towards the early coffee stands as one collective organism, right. So, everyone is moving towards the coffee stands as one collective organism which is tired and exhausted. So, the entire humanity, the entire uh, mankind over here in this metropolis is represented as one exhausted organism, as one exhausted animal which is present towards the coffee stand uh, to rejuvenate itself artificially with caffeine. With the other masquerades, the time resumes. So, masquerades is an important word over here, it means pretentious performances. So, you put on a mask, which is to say that you know you are hiding, you are concealing your true self. So, if you again remember the love song of J. Alfred Prufong, where the human uh, subject, the very neurotic male subject over there says quite clearly, uh, there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. So, the entire idea of preparing a face, it entails a performative quality. So, you have to perform uh, social meetings, have to perform social exchanges, social pleasantries, right. And that is described over here with the word masquerade. So, the entire idea of masquerade are those rituals of pretension, the rituals of politeness with which you carry on your pretentious, petty, metropolitan life, right. So, the other masquerades the time resumes. And the word resume over here is interesting because normally uh, when you use the word resume, it normally has a positive connotation. But again, look at the way in which uh, certain traditional markers of positivity like lightning of the lambs, consciousness, uh, you know, resuming of something, uh, all these traditional markers of positivity and progress, they are actually uh, subverted into something which are quite negative in quality. So, what gets resumed over here? The masquerades, the meaningless rituals of polite performances, they get resumed over here and they are the ones which are repeated over and over again. So, it is like a ritual of reputation and what that 
collectively does all these markets away. Um, it gives you a sense of a very Sisyphean uh, condition, very Sisyphean uh, lifestyle. You know, I'm obviously referring to the myth of Sisyphus, S I S Y P H U S, which is a very ancient uh, Greek myth, myth of a man uh, doomed. Uh, to push a stone on top of a hill, as you, I'm sure this is familiar to most of you. So the man pushes a stone on top of the hill, and every time the stone reaches the top of the hill, it just rolls down again. So he is uh, doomed to forever do something which is completely purposeless. So the stone will never stay on top of the hill, and yet he's doomed to push it all the way up. So there's something of a Sisyphean quality of this life lifestyle as well. So every day is a repetition of the previous day and an anticipation of the next day, right? So the masquerades are being resumed by time. So time becomes a marker of masquerades over here. Time entails, uh, you know, this whole idea, the whole markers, the whole repetitive rituals get resumed, right? So again, this is very similar to the setting that we saw in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. With the exception, with the difference that that particular setting was very bourgeois, very, was very privileged in quality, whereas this is more working class, more elevated, more impoverished in quality. But the mood, uh, the mood of ennui, the effect of ennui is very similar in both the poems. With the other masquerades, the time resumes, one thinks of all the hands that are raised in dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. Again, the focus is on the hand. So again, look at the way in which the hand, the foot, the feet, they all, the human body is just represented through fragments, through certain broken parts, through certain metonymic images, never fully, right? So one thinks of all the hands, so all the hands are collectively raised in dingy shades. So again, look at the collective motion, which is to say everything is standardized, everything is one collective uniform motion. So everyone wakes up at the same time, everyone has coffee at the same time, everyone uh, raises a dingy shades at the same time. And the last line of this particular stanza, in a thousand furnished rooms. So all the rooms are uh, supposedly furnished in very similar ways. So thousand furnished rooms is obviously hyperbolic in quality, but what that does over here, it gives you a sense of the standardization. So all the rooms are standardized in the same way. So all the rooms, thousand rooms, they're all furnished together in a very similar fashion. And in a one that's thinking of all the hands that are raising the dingy shapes in all the thousand furnished rooms. So again, the whole idea of uniformity and standardization, which obviously undercuts the agency or the individuality of the human subject. So in other words, this metro metropolitan lifestyle, this metropolitan space doesn't offer you any agency. You just become a cog in the wheel uh, in this machinery of modernity and where your only job is to carry on the, the rituals, the little petty metropolitan rituals which are collectively done by all the human beings. So the human beings don't seem to have any agency. There's no break from that uh, motion. There's no break from the collective motion of ennui. So you just become a cog in the wheel in this process of modernity, this machinery of modernity, which is being represented in the first two stanzas. So I'll stop at this point today and the next lecture will hopefully conclude this poem with the last two stanza. Thank you for your attention.